Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. Finding the right chord to better enjoy music and using art as a way to fight cancer in the cities. It has been 18 years since downtown Davenport's River Renaissance took shape with a renovated redstone building that was to be a celebration of music and the river. Now after almost two decades, that dream has grown and the river music experience, as it came to be known, is starting a new chapter. The people who run the RME have decided to rebrand it and rename the river music experience Common Chord. But what's the motive behind the change? And is it part of bigger changes still to come? We talked with the executive director of Common Chord, Tyson Danner. So why would you make the change from RME to Common Chord? Well, we're very different than <laughs> when we started. Almost 20 years ago in 2004 when we were created, uh, the River Music Experience was created as a museum for roots music. Roots music, the blues, the jazz that traveled up and down the Mississippi the River. The link to the river. Yep, that's where we started. Uh, but pretty soon after we opened, the program started growing. We started saying, we need to get out there and do some education. We need to provide some concert programming. And now, almost two decades later, we're, we're a different organization. It's bigger than anyone expected. It's broader than anyone expected. We do all kinds of music. Um, in the Redstone Room this fall, we'll have EDM shows, we'll have jazz shows, we'll have rock shows, we'll have bluegrass shows, we'll have hip-hop shows. So we needed to be able to give ourselves a name that more accurately reflected that bigger picture mission. Well, and any organization really has to change to survive. You have to morph to your audience. You have to learn from who's using you and who you still need to get uh, to. We, we've found that out the past few years. Yeah, well. And the organizations that did adapt, and pivots the buzzword, right? Yeah. But the organizations that adapted and kept asking themselves, what do we need to be for our community? Those are the organizations that have grown and thrived instead of just sort of struggling along through COVID. Common Chord, what does it mean? Common Chord, it's all about community. So, so we want to be able to tell folks we're for everybody. We're for all kinds of music, all people, musicians and non-musicians, that common thread that ties us together. You know, we talk about music as a universal language. It's something that really has the ability to connect people, which is more and more rare these days. But you can go to a show and you can stand next to somebody that maybe voted for somebody else or maybe thinks differently on this issue or that issue, and you're just there together having a good time, and the music is what's doing that. So the common chord, the common thread that brings us together. We're talking about a change in name, but oftentimes it's so much more than that. Is there going to be a change in philosophy? Is, 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 is the mission changing? The mission is broader. And it, and it really, you know, today is not the change point. Our growth and evolution has happened over the last few years. Those new programs that people have seen popping up, the, the One Sound Piano Project, uh, our in tune music mentoring program, new genres of music we've been putting out there, that's all been developing over a few years and people have responded to it so great. So the name change is really the final piece of this puzzle. It's finally the name catching up to what we've actually been doing the past couple of years. It is a unique idea and it was part of a revitalization two decades ago for the downtown Davenport area. Is there a model that you have as far as what Common Chord is supposed to be like some other large city has something like this? There are similar organizations, though it's more common that organizations focus on one area. They might be a music education organization. They might be a nonprofit performance venue. They might be a music council that advocates for the music scene. We're a conglomeration of quite a few of those things. We have pretty broad programming. 
Um, but, we, but we have a music scene and a community that supports that level of work and all those different programs. Well, everyone remembers it as an old department store, the old yeah. Von Peterson's Von Mar yeah. uh, department store and then uh, the, the Redstone mm -hmm. building. Um, and, and it has been a solid place for you to operate. Mm -hmm. But that's not it anymore. I mean, you guys really are reaching out into the community more than ever. I mean, is that an, an incredibly important part of your mission? Absolutely. You know, the, the phrase, church folks know this, right? The church is not the people. Uh, the church is not, not the building. building. The church is not the steeple. The church is the people. Right. And that's true of nonprofits. We may happen to, that building is a great asset we have, and we're really proud to keep helping build the downtown Davenport, which is, is not what it was 20 years ago. Right. Um, and and uh, Common Cord and, and RME played a big role in that. But the, the building is our home base. The real work we do is not keep a building going. The real work we do is make music experiences happen. That happens a lot in our building because we've got a venue to program that's a beautiful venue. It happens a lot in all sorts of other places. You know, our education programs happen in schools. Our in-tune music mentoring program happens in community centers all across the Quad Cities. Those pianos are everywhere from Davenport to, to uh, the Niobe Zoo to LeClaire. We're all over the place. So where do you go from here? I mean, you, you learned an awful lot from uh, the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, COVID. Um, it, it limited your ability to, let's say, go into schools or, 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 or to bring people into the Redstone uh, building in order for, to have lessons. I mean, it was limited. It wasn't stopped. I mean, what did you get from the pandemic that you're able to, you know, this is, what we're, this is how our mission's changing? Mm -hmm. It was a good reminder for us that, you know, programs might change from time to time. The way we do things might change, but the core of it's still the same. The core of it is bringing people together and connecting people through music. In the pandemic, there was a long period of time, the only way we did that was with videos and Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're able to go back out and do that with concerts and educational programs. But so as programs develop over the years, that might change. That core mission, though, of bringing people together through music, that's what we're all about. I want to ask you about something. Talk about the Echo. Now yeah. in its uh, second year, it focuses on the digital music scene. I mean, that's another issue that, I mean, when you talk about the RME, as you said, it was the roots. It was, it was music maybe 100 years ago that was so uh, uh, rooted in with the uh, Mississippi River. And now we're talking about digital music and, and a whole vast new genre as well as reality for music. Right. And the Echo does cover all sorts of music, too, traditional styles included. Um, but when we look at our whole music scene, we see the evolution of all those different genres. And people do tend to have their genres they like. You know, you might be a, you might be a Springsteen fan. I might be a Beatles fan. And that might, may be where we live. But as you get out there in your community and connect to more people, you see the variety and diversity of things that are happening in the Quad Cities. We often don't realize it because we're creatures of habit. Right. We tend to go to the same places, listen to the same music. We have an awesome, thriving hip-hop and rap scene here. Um, and a lot of those artists are doing work in their small studios, in the garage, you know, the garage band thing, in the basement, um, that don't have access to larger venues like the Redstone Room. Uh, so one thing we have, uh, we've been doing over the past year, we're coming up this year too, we're building partnerships with a lot of those studios, especially in those genres that don't get the same kind of access as some of the, the more traditional genres do, um, and making sure we have performance spaces for those. But also, when we look around at the music scene, we see great venues like the Raccoon Motel that's just completed their first year of operation. We see Gypsy Highway in Davenport. We see Roz Talks in Rock Island, all these great spaces that make up a music scene. Part of our work at Common Chord is saying, okay, what are we doing today to help make sure they're thriving? What do we do today to make sure Ross Tox is there in five years and continuing to produce awesome music events? So it goes beyond our building in that way, too. Not just beyond our building, but beyond even our own programming. So once again, with the pandemic, I mean, it, it just seemed like there was in the music industry or in uh, a theater or anywhere else, everyone was holding back. They couldn't get out there and perform. And then all of a sudden, audiences arrive again. And, and, and the ability to share time with people in a, in a small area comes back again. And there was this big rush of creativity that flowed out. Have you noticed that? I mean, I mean is, and, and is, is that momentum continuing? We really did notice it. I mean, <laughs> we've, been, we've been busy the, in the past. We started shows again indoors last September, so it's been about a year. 
And we still see that. There is the, the pent-up demand that, that a lot of folks were expecting. We really did see it. But the interesting thing about that is it broke habits. So folks uh. that tended to just go to, maybe they only ever went to the Redstone Room. And they just went and they stopped by Redstone Room every weekend and saw what they expected from us, a blue show, a rock show. Um, then they couldn't do that for a couple years. And then all of a sudden, they have to proactively look online, see what events are going on. Oh, that looks interesting. I've never been to that venue before. So not only did you see folks bounce back to the places they were familiar with, all of a sudden there is a spreading out. And you have new relationships building between music venues and producers and artists. So it's really been interesting to see. And we're, and we're seeing ripple effects of that, too, just on the practical side. We have a lot of touring bands that come through the Redstone Room. Right. Those, a lot of times we're booking them six months in advance, a year in advance. Well, there's some things coming up in the next two months that are still being worked on. Yeah. Because everything, that whole schedule of touring and, and tour legs, it, it all got thrown off. Um, but it's been really for the best, ultimately, um, for, the, for the scene, for the industry as a whole. Because it just opened the door to so many new thinking. The other thing is that, I mean, we talk about the performances and we talk about the museum as well that, that uh, celebrates uh, Big Spider Beck, mm -hmm. of course, is down in the basement. Um, uh, talk to me about the youth, because uh, you've, you've, you've had uh, uh, rock camps, you've, you've, you've really tried to reach out to kids to get them to love music. And that seems to be one of the many successes that we've seen over the last uh, 18 years. Absolutely. And that, that's the, one of those big gaps that we're filling, right? Creating education programs is hard work. It's expensive. It takes staff time, mm -hmm. and it takes a real dedication to building those relationships with schools. Because school, it's not like school administrators are sitting around twiddling their thumbs, what do we do now? They're busy, and their days are packed. Um, but we try to make sure we're giving kids a lot of opportunity to broaden their horizons a little bit. You know, they're hearing a certain kind of music at home, uh, based on what their parents listen to, right. probably. And they're hearing a certain kind of music in school music class, which, unfortunately, is happening less and less these days, right? Mm -hmm. They may get 20 mu minutes of music once a week. So we try to get in there and give them some broader thinking. Our, our school program, River Currents, is, is based on some of the original museum curriculum. So it's about the roots music and American music styles, how it came up from New Orleans, um, how all American music really descends from enslaved people, and how it originally came from Africa and how it went up the Mississippi River, and we got to benefit from that from the riverboats. And all the way up through, how did Elvis come from that? How did Taylor Swift come from that? How did Nicki Minaj come from that? Because they did, um, and that's how our music styles have evolved, and it connects the kids in a much broader way of thinking to their past. Well, if you haven't been to the RME in a while, come by now, yeah. see what Common Chord is all about, I mean, you, you must be wanting to see some fresh faces there. We, we'd love to. Uh, this, this new mission, this new vision is broader, and there's more room for everybody. Uh, more room, no matter what kind of genre you like, no matter what kind of skill level you have, um, whoever you are, there's room. Um, particularly October 23rd, we have a family Halloween show. So that's a family show designed so there's kids' activities that kids can physically engage while listening to the music costume contest, you know, costume photo booth, the works. So, and all the kids, kids are free. Parents are 10 bucks, kids are free, free pizza. Uh, it's a four o'clock in the afternoon show, so young kids can still make a home in time for bed. So we're hoping families come out and help us uh, do a little Halloween party that day. Our thanks to Tyson Danner, Executive Director of Common Chord. More concerts are scheduled on the community stage and the Redstone Room at Common Chord, but there are other great performances and events that you might want to consider. Here's Laura Adams with some of what you can do if you go out and about. This is Out and About for September 30th through October 6th. Pack up your pup for a family fun dog walking event. Tales on Trails along the river at Ben Butterworth Parkway October 1st from 11 to 12.30. Plus there's a fall doggy fest at the Eleanor Wallace Dog Park in Rock Island. It's on the 2nd from 1 to 3. 
State Street Market Geneseo takes place in downtown Geneseo October 1st from 10 to 5, while over 100 artists and vendors display their wares at the Milan Improvement Project Craft and Vendor Fair on the 2nd from 8 to 3 at Bob Erickson Chevrolet. RME's Live at 5 concert series ends the 30th with Orangadang from 5 to 7, while Thursday Night Groove at Schwebert Park features North of 40 on the 29th and Piso's Cure on October 6th. The Clinton Symphony Orchestra start their 69th season on October 1st with music from the opera Cold Mountain at the Vernon Cook Theater at Clinton High School. Hinder performs at the Rust Belt on October 3rd, while Circa 21 continues their run of Clue the Musical and a special performance of Believe the Share Show on October 6th. The Producers, the musical by Mel Brooks, takes the stage at the Spotlight Theater the 30th through October 8th, and Playcrafters Barn Theater present A.R. Gurney's romantic comedy, Sylvia, September 30th through October 9th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Jenny Lynn Stacy has returned to performing after stepping back from the music scene for the past two years. We already had caught up with her, though, when she performed one of her originals at the Black Box Theater in downtown Moline. So here's Jenny Lynn Stacy with I Prefer It. this way This way. Jenny Lynn Stacy performing at the Black Box Theater in downtown Moline with I Prefer It. Art can be therapeutic, and few groups have embraced that philosophy quite as completely as the Living Proof exhibit created a dozen years ago. It meshes together the arts and anyone who's impacted by cancer. And like cancer, that can take on several different forms. It includes a visualization of hope exhibit that's now open at the Figgy Art Museum in downtown Davenport. The executive director of the Living Proof exhibit joins us right now. It's Jordan Kirkbride. So the Living Proof exhibit is now available at the Figgy Art Museum. I mean, putting it together is a huge deal. I mean, how much work goes into something like that? Um, we start um, the year before yeah. kind of recruiting um, and talking to the museums because every other year, we are in a different location outside of the Figgy, um, but we just kind of start confirming dates and reminding artists the year before. And then our call for entry goes um, live in March. And then we have um, a June deadline normally. 
And then we spend the summer collecting artwork, getting everything ready, and then it only it's goes up in the fall, yeah. To best my analogy, your last exhibit was in Dubuque, was yes, it not? Yes, at and the now, University of Dubuque. Exactly. So mm -hmm. now, now it's in the Quad Cities. Yes. It's in uh, the Figgy. What is, what is the importance of it? I mean, we, we're talking about art, and we're talking about cancer. We're talking about sending a message to. Yes. Um, so our mission is to provide the therapeutic benefits of the arts to people touched by cancer. Um, so we feel that the exhibit in particular is just a great way to share that mission. Um, all of the artists are cancer survivors, and they all use different mediums to tell their stories. And with their artist statements, too, you can read their stories while looking at their art, and you can really um, involve yourself in their stories. Well, you, you, people don't want sympathy. Right. They, but they do want inspiration. Yes. Um, and I would assume that that is what you see over and over again. Yes, um, all of these stories are so inspiring. I mean, we have several artists who, when they talk about their treatments and their diagnosis, they couldn't even get out of bed, you know? And um, art is what got them back into them. They brought them back to themselves. So I was gonna say, the, the, the displays, the exhibit that's at the Figgy, it, it, it's, it impacts the people that are looking at it, of course. Yes. You know, the patrons. But it's the opposite as well. I mean, uh, uh, the artists are literally pouring their hearts into this. Yes, and they spend months, sometimes years, working on these pieces. Um, I have one artist in particular. She has a paper mache 3D flower that just comes out of the wall. Um, and she started working on that months in advance of the call. And we were talking about it as she was going, like, do you think this is going to work? And, yeah. and it's just a, a huge investment for them, and I think that people viewing the exhibit also can see that they're giving a piece of themselves on display. Now, we're talking about artists from a, a very large yes. area in eastern Iowa and western Illinois. Yes, um, so we have artists um, from Dubuque, Iowa, Springfield, Illinois, um, a few artists out near Cedar Rapids. Um, so, and a lot of our artists are based in the Quad Cities, but by broadening that range, um, we can tell so many more stories and, and increase the impact that the stories have. Did you have a theme in particular for this exhibit? Um, it's always hope, mm -hmm. and it just shows up in different ways. Um, I will say that this year we have a lot of flowers and birds, and I'm not well, sure. I was going to say, do you know that, why? I don't. I don't know, and maybe that's just something that people found particularly interesting. I mean, there's photographs of flowers and birds. There's um, collage, paper mache pieces have to do with flowers and birds. I'm not sure why, but yes, we, we noticed that last night at the opening reception. Taking, talking more about um, the artists that are involved, I mean, you must have various age groups as well, as well as men and women. Yes. I mean, can you really tell? Because cancer impacts people in so many different ways. People express themselves in so many different ways. So you add those two together, artwork through cancer, there must be incredible stories that are different between men and women and, and younger and older people. Yes, they're all different, and um, we have some, some of our artists are in their 30s, um, and some are in their 60s, um, 70s, and while their diagnosis and the way that they were treated, is, they're all very different. The stories, um, the themes of the stories are the same, that you know, they were, their worlds were just completely turned upside down, and art brought them back. Art can be so powerful. Um, and, and, and sometimes the story behind the art is even more powerful. Well, like you were saying, is that there, there's also the, uh, the written comments that are from some of the artists telling a little bit of the backstory. I mean, how, how important is it for people to actually get the total immersion by reading that as well? You can see it's beautiful artwork yeah. when it stands alone, but to read their stories, you just truly understand that you know, the, the subject matter is sometimes inspiring to them. Um, and they express themselves through the subject matter, but sometimes it's the medium. You know, some, that we have one artist who, you know, she, she finds the joy in just photography. It's on her phone. It's something as simple as a phone. Um, and it, you get that full experience when you see the work and read the story. Well, and you're able to collect these, as we said, from so many different artists, and then, and then to make this presentation, as we mm -hmm. said, until the end of the year at the Figgy Art Museum. Um, do you hear from the artists that 
we really needed a place to show, you know, thank you for the opportunity, thank you for letting me express myself, and thank you for giving me an audience. Absolutely, they are so grateful to be, uh, have their works on display, especially at the Figgy. I mean, it's such a prestigious um, establishment here in the QC, and they, they recognize that that's such an honor, and um, the camaraderie amongst artists is especially um, inspiring. Um, we were together last night, and they were just in awe of the works, all displayed together, but also individually. It, once again, it's called a, visual, a visualization of hope. Yes. Um, and, and I think of that in two different ways, because I keep thinking that you really have two audiences. One is the artist, and one is the patron. And, and, and the vi visualization of hope can be interpreted in so many different ways yes. between those two different things. Is that kind of part of your calling, is, is, is to have that? Yes, and I think that um, the visualization part, you know, it's not just um, to come and see the works on display, but to, again, read the stories, hear their, the, what brought them to Living Proof Exhibit, and then to visualize this brought them hope, this healed their heart, that art changed their lives, and this is how. I should point out that Living Proof Exhibit, you're around. 12 months a year. I mean, you, you, yes. you, you are obviously doing other things in the community. Tell me about a few of the others. Um, we hold monthly art yeah. sessions free to anyone touched by cancer. Um, and we have our annual exhibit, obviously. And um, we also have art in local, the local cancer centers as well. Um, and we have created art to go projects too, where um, they're just small, compact projects that you can send to someone who might be isolating at home or who needs a pick me up. Um, we have several programs where we can help people touched by cancer. How does somebody contact you in case they, you know, either they would like it or sure. they know somebody that could, like you said, this is a pick-me-up or it's an outlet to express your rage, your anger, your hope, or, yes. or all those emotions? Um, you can find us at livingproofexhibit.org, um, and we also are on Facebook at Living Proof Exhibit. Where do you hope the organization goes from here? I mean, you've got a lot on your plate. Um, you know the need is there. Cancer is still, you know, ravaging so much of the population for so many different people. What, what do you hope for the future? Um, I hope that we, that our reach just grows. Um, we, in particular, particular, are focusing on Spanish-speaking communities right now. Um, we know that there's a need there, um, and we also would like to shift some of our focus to reaching whole families, having very family-friendly events where we. Um, can engage children and their parents or grandparents and share with them the joy of creating and allow them to share that joy together. Because it's not only the cancer of the patient, but as you pointed out, it's the children, it's yes. the family, it's the, it's, it's the adults and everybody else. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Jordan Kirkbride, Executive Director of the Living Proof Exhibit. The group's 2022 exhibition, A Visualization of Hope, continues at the Figgy Art Museum until the end of the year on the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, plus streaming on your computer. Thanks for joining us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.